Community Organizing, Lessons from Ontario's Grassroots Disability Accessibility Campaign. David Lepofsky, Chair, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. Delivered at the Osgoode Hall Law School, January 31st, 2014, as a Roy McMurtry Clinical Fellow. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in other parts of this lecture series, I'm talking about the history of our accessibility movement and the, the legal and practical and policy issues we faced and, and so on. Today is going to be very different. I want to talk to you about practical strategies that I have learned over 20 or more years doing community organizing and advocacy on how to be effective as a community organizer or advocate. I'm not boasting by saying, here are all the great things that I and my coalition do. If only you could just do the things we do, you'll be a success. We have learned, I have learned as much from mistakes um, as from um, successes. And what I'm gonna bring together for you now is a collection of successes. It is, it's hard to find things written on this. This isn't what we normally teach in law school. And it's not the unique preserve of, of lawyers. On the other hand, there are instances that we can look to of people who graduated from a good law school, learned and became active as a community organizer, and went on to some pretty good things. One of them, uh, one individual who comes to mind, his name is Barack Obama. Uh, so um, uh, there's lots of people to learn from uh, who've done work in, in this area. Uh, also, on your law school curriculum, there aren't books on this. There are books worth reading, the, the, probably the best the earliest and still the Bible are the books by Saul Alinsky, A-L-I-N-S-K-Y, Rules for Radicals and Radi Reveille for Radicals from the, from the 50s and the 60s, a, a community organizer who set the stage uh, and from whom we all learned. Um, he went from being a radical, uh, self-described, to being taught now as regular course material in social work programs, uh, social work uh, schools around the, around the world. Um, let me offer you some high point themes and I'm going to get into a series of practical activities um, that one might face when you're doing community organizing for any kind of community and community advocacy. This will be useful whether you are playing the role of a lawyer or not playing the role of a, as a lawyer. As, a, as the uh, chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act before, committee, before that the chair of the Ontarians with Disabilities Act, uh, pardon me, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance, and before that the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Committee, I wasn't a lawyer, I was, I was, a, I was a, in a volunteer leadership role, and, uh, but things I learned uh, have informed my lawyering and things I learned about lawyering inform my work as a community uh, leader and organizer even if I wasn't playing the role of counsel. A few general themes I want to uh, offer you at the start, uh, uh, or practical tips. The first is, you are constantly learning. You are constantly learning. Every time you try something, every time you think about trying to do something, I encourage you to look at it, critique it, did it work, what could we have done better? Um, it is nothing like litigation. It is nothing, in fact, you have to turn off any training you've got as a litigator. Often in litigation, you're trained to uh, use specific rules to counter specific points to achieve a certain litigation goal. Um, in the arena of community organizing and advocacy, you sometimes have to do the exact opposite of what a litigator would do. It is important to look for natural allies. It may be a, pol if you're advocating on disability issues, it may be a politician as a spouse or a child or a parent with a disability or more, them more may themselves have a disability. It may be one of their advisors who does. There are natural allies, whatever be the issue, wherever you are, they are often not readily apparent. They require some investigating. But wherever you go, whatever you do, constantly be attuned for looking for someone who is a natural ally. Once you find them, harness that opportunity. Get them on your side, find out what they can do to help you. In a court proceeding, you make a brilliant argument, you win the case, you get reasons for judgment, and you know your argument was the brilliant one that won the case. In community advocacy, rarely is that the case. You're constantly retuning your argument, and you never know which argument you pitch, which idea you uh, present, which media art article on a point uh, that comes out drives home the message in a way that actually changes the agenda of a government or an opposition party. That means keep trying and don't assume you've only got one argument that's ever gonna work. Whenever you are retuning your arguments, whenever you are trying to figure out what works, 
Um, it's important to know that you have to be, like in a litigation setting, sometimes there are commonalities, you have to constantly be attuned to what the other side might be thinking. If you're advocating for disability accessibility legislation, be ready for a government that is preoccupied with cutting its deficit. Be ready to show that what you're proposing will save the government money, not cost the government money. They may never tell you that's their number one concern when they're in meetings with you. They may think it would be inappropriate to say that. They don't want to quote it back, but you want to know what they're really thinking uh, and, uh, and, and to be ready to counter arguments even before they're made, even if they're never made. Now, now with those common themes in mind, let me jump right in. Number one, how do you frame your message? Uh, it's really important to try to get whatever it is you're campaigning for down to a slogan, down to a punchy one-liner. Uh, for the Disability Act community, we said we want to achieve a barrier-free society for people with disabilities, and we wanted a new law that would get us there. You want to define that statement in a way that no one's going to disagree with you. Who's in favor of barriers against people with disabilities? Who thinks they're a good idea? Who thinks more should be created? We might debate over how we're gonna get rid of them, but we could happily agree we've gotta get rid of them. They're bad for society. So the, uh, the very argument, or the very statement of the goal, a barrier-free society for all people with disabilities, uh, becomes not, over, not only a flag or a banner under which we can advocate, it itself is a form of persuasion. In framing that message, we try to avoid terminology that will antagonize some. Traditionally, in the human rights context, we talk about discrimination because that's what uh, the law, uh, the term the law uses in the Charter and in the Human Rights Codes. But the term discrimination gets people's backs up. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to be in the law, and I'm not saying that human rights lawyers shouldn't use them. But on the other hand, if you walk into a restaurant and say, you're discriminating against me because you have a, or not walk in, but if you've got a wheelchair and you can't get in, you say, you're discriminating against me because you've got two steps at your front door. Number one, they never thought of it as discrimination. And number two, the accusation of discrimination um, could get people very antagonized. On the other hand, if you say, those two steps at your front door are a barrier to my coming in and spending money in your restaurant, for one thing, they can't deny it's a barrier. And for another thing, they'd like you to spend money in their restaurant. So you've now defined the barrier in a way that hurts uh, an individual with a disability and the business. Try to find terminology that will unite everybody behind you rather than dividing and antagonizing people. There's ways to turn an argument so it sounds stronger even though it's the same information. We used to say that there's 17% of Ontario or 18% of the public who have disabilities. One day it occurred to us that the exact same number could be expressed in a more powerful way. How about telling a politician that there's 1.8 million people who have a disability? And note my inflection when I say the M word. All of a sudden, the politician in their mind, or their staffer, starts imagining what 1.8 million people looks like. That's a lot of people. That's not some small minority. They gotta be concerned about it. If you wanna make the, the, the statement even stronger, call them voters with disabilities, because unless they're kids under 18, they're voters. And if you want the attention of politicians, tell them that we have 1.8 million people with disabilities in Ontario. Tell them that because disproportionately they're older, we will underestimate that there's at least 1 million voters with disabilities in the province. And all of a sudden, um, a politician has got to sit up and listen. That 18% figure that sounds like it's uh, a, a small little minority relative, relative to the 82% uh, the who don't have a disability, um, all of a sudden the number sounds more powerful. But even then, there's a way to make that number even stronger. And you'll see it in a number of the speeches that are made on behalf of my coalition. We have defined people with disabilities as the minority of everyone because other, everyone either has a disability or knows someone near and dear who has one or will get one. So all of a sudden, we're not just 18%, we're not just 1.8 million people, we are potentially everyone. Now a politician really can't ignore you because of the fact that they really don't want to be on the side of no one against everyone. Um, and in the back of their minds, by saying it that way, they might sort of think about the fact that if they don't have a disability yet, they too will get one eventually. That involves literally redefining our constituency in a way to include everyone, and it's completely genuine. Um, there are also ways to present your message in a way that becomes more powerful, even if it's the same message. Here's an illustration. In the olden days, blind people argued for Braille. 
deaf people for sign language, people in wheelchairs for ramps, and the government could see them as separate groups that they might treat separately or even play off against each other. When we unite behind the term barrier, we are indeed now united and can't be divided. But it gets even more powerful when it's the deaf person who argues about the need for braille, the blind person who argues about the need for ramps, and the person in the wheelchair who talks about the need for sign language to show that we are speaking about each other's needs. The exact same message by the same people, but by a little, uh, uh, a little uh, re uh, revolving assignment of the message, it becomes more powerful. There are so many other ways to, uh, to, to talk about how to frame your message. These ideas I've just offered didn't all come at once. They've evolved over years. Let me talk to you next about educating the constituency or community uh, that you're looking to organize or to bring together. The public and governments, and certainly the media, thinks that every social group in society is completely organized, has a well-oiled spokesperson, loaded up with money, press releases, briefs, and research, ready to jump on any issue that just happens to come up. Would that it were so, it isn't. And so for most community uh, constituencies that might want to have an issue raised in the public arena, and those especially who are disempowered or who are uh, not from the most powerful in society, they don't have that kind of pre-made infrastructure in place. And any community organizer, anybody trying to do some kind of community advocacy, has as an early job to, to educate their own constituency and build a consensus around a message. Here's just a couple of ideas that I can offer. The first is never underestimate one's constituency. There is a tendency, especially, dare I say it, among lawyers to think that we know everything about law and that lay people just will trust us to take care of those things. Uh, the truth is we must be good at explaining uh, our issues and the uh, policy issues at stake and indeed legal issues to lay people. We must be able to empower them to speak about it themselves. If we leave it to leaders, whether lawyers or not, or spokespeople, whether lawyers or not, we've essentially cut off the vast majority of voices that could be rallied to bring the message to the public. So it's important to not underestimate their ability. I have found that the most complex questions of public policy, if properly presented, can be grasped, understood, processed, critically thought about, and advocated for by people with the absolute least credentials, education, training, and experience. That's part of the job of an effective community organizer. I'm really become the most anti-elitist in doing this kind of activity, and I'm constantly delighted at how many people with the least uh, uh, fancy credentials come up with the best ideas, frame it in the most effective way, and get their message across way more effectively um, than the usual suspect uh, person, frankly, like, uh, like me. Um, one thing to know about any constituency or any community or sector of community is A, they're really busy, B, they're typically exhausted, C, whatever issue you're presenting, no matter how important, will go on a plate that already has a million issues, and it'll go on that plate as number one million and one. So the key role of the community organizer is to make information available in a way that's easy to absorb. Uh, now, anyone who reads the updates that my coalition sends out and that I write is gonna say that Lepofsky is like the biggest violator because often these updates are long and detailed. Um, but there is method to our madness. What we do when we send out an update Whatever the issue is, the subject line in our email tells you enough that if you don't know anything more, that could be your message. If you open the update, you'll see that there's then a headline, written like a newspaper headline, longer than the subject line of the email, and it will also frame the argument in one line or two, everything you need to know. If that's all people read, if that's all they can convey to a journalist, politician, or otherwise, it's still effective. We then provide a summary for those who want to read further. And then we provide longer and more detailed resources. And I'm delighted with how many times, how many people read the entire document and then give us feedback on it. Very thoughtful, creative, and well-considered feedback. Um, probably the biggest impediment to community organizing, 
It's not money, because my coalition doesn't raise money at all or charge money for its membership. Um, the biggest impediment is people thinking there's nothing they can do. The government is a big, lumbering uh, organization, uh, incapable of changing, won't listen, they just issue news releases, um, out of touch with the people. That is the biggest impediment, and therefore, um, the big, one of the most important jobs of any community organizer is disabusing people of that sense, giving them the feeling that one or two little things that they do could really help. And in designing proposals for them of action, for action, it's best to give them things that are easy to do, quick to do, and people will immediately go, that it will, pardon me, that will quickly disabuse them of the sense of futility, that there's just nothing I could do. If it's just a matter of call your member of the legislature, or call a phone-in radio station, or retweet a tweet, something that can be done within a minute, but that overcome, but both advances our agenda and neutralizes or reduces that pervading sense that there's nothing uh, I could do about it. To enable people to do that, it's vital to be able to let people, encourage people to tie their own experiences to whatever the message is. So if we're advocating on accessibility, we will say, here's the message, we need a new disability act, or we need a, an accessibility standard in the area of education, whatever it may be, but then we'll encourage you to tell your own story. So if it's a student who's faced barriers in school, or a parent who's not been with a disability who's faced barriers being able to go to their own kid's school play, or whatever it may be, give them a way to immediately apply their own experience. Once they do that, they'll find that A, it's easy to start talking because it's something that bothers them, and B, it makes them feel like they are connected to the, to the issue you're presenting, because they are. When we, um, one of the tools we use, is, I'm gonna use this as an illustration for both empowering, uh, developing consensus and creating motion, movement. We periodically will issue what we call an action kit. I believe for today's class, I provided you the one which we've got on the AODA Alliance website at aodaalliance.org and there's the What's New link. There's action kits all along there. You can just search on the words action kit. But Ontario has two by-elections on February uh, 13th, 2014, and we put out an action kit with tips on how to get involved uh, in the by-elections. So, one of the mess underlying everything we do is, is, is with these action kit is something I learned really early on in doing my community advocacy. If you get up in front of a very enthused audience, get them all motivated to on an issue, and then say, "Will you go home and write your member of the Ontario Legislature and press them to do X?" You'll have a room full of people who will happily nod, and they really mean it. But when they get home, most of them won't write that letter because they're busy, they got other stuff to do, it takes too long, they've never done it before. However, what we found is if you give them a sample letter, they will go home and they will take it and they will copy and paste it and they will make, and if you encourage them to not just send it as is, if they don't have any time, send it as is. If they have more time, change the wording, add your own experience. People will, you get a lot of letters. The exact same people, the exact same motivation, but a lot more action. So think of us as the fast food of political action. Make it easier to do. We do this through an action kit. What's in the action kit? Um, it focuses on a specific period of time, a specific goal. So if it's a by-election, it's relevant from now until February 13th, 2014. And if the goal is raise disability accessibility issues in the by-election, then what you're doing is saying, hey, here's a campaign. What we're asking you to do one way or another is to get talking about this. And I'll tell you, if you go to the media and try to raise these issues in a by-election, it's really hard to get coverage. But getting grassroots folks out doing it, um, yes, it can be done. What do you do in an action kit? What, we, we, what we'll do is give people a really quick synthesis of what the issues are, and to the extent we know it, the positions of the parties. And we try to boil that down to as brief an entry as possible and then provide links for those who want to read more about these subjects. And then what we do is we will offer people two things. First, a list of questions they might ask at a, uh, uh, politicians or that they can raise with voters. And then second, a list of actions that they can take. Those actions could include going to an all-candidates debate, calling candidates from different parties, even if someone just comes to your door canvassing, raise these issues 
Raise it with friends and families who might want to vote. Fax or email this to your local media and get them to raise it. Call a call-in show. What we've found through these action kits is it's amazing how, and delightful how many people actually use these tips and who come up with other ideas. But it's got to fit in a few pages. It's got to be easy to read with headings that get people right into the meat of why we're doing it and what to do. This is sort of one, this is one sample. You can use it not just during a by-election, but for many, many, many other kinds of activities. I remember one day I was speaking at a, uh, an event years ago in London, and a man I'd never met before named Michael Lewis came up to me and he said, I'm a folk singer, he's totally blind, and he said, can I write a song for you guys? I said, can you? Like, go for it! Never thought of it before. He wrote a song called Still Waiting. It was fabulous. It, uh, um, a community group in London produced a video that went with it, depicting different barriers facing people with disabilities. It became our anthem for years. Sadly, Michael died the year that the Disabilities Act was about to be developed and enacted. A conference in, uh, working on its devel the development of legislation was named after him, and the theme still waiting still resonates. Just one person who took one of his life skills, songwriting and folk singing, and put it into action in a way that none of us had thought of. Tons of examples like that just abound. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about developing um, uh, consensus. It is impossible to unite an entire community on anything. So to try to seek unanimity is futile. My belief is to aim, or my goal is to aim for harmony, not unanimity. There will be dissension. There are a couple of strategies for dealing with it. Here are some of them. First, it is important to frame your platform in a term that as few people will disagree with as possible. Barrier-free society, how many people with disabilities are going to get up and say, if I'm in front of people with disabilities, I say, how many of you think we don't face barriers? People chuckle. How many of you think they're being removed quickly enough? People chuckle again. Do you think we should do more about it? And do you think it should be mandatory? All of a sudden, these are all questions that, that unite people. But there will be people who disagree. Whatever it is we propose, there will be people who say, you need more, you should ask for more. Um, it's important to make requests that are realistic that won't draw the, uh, the fire of uh, government or other communities that'll say that's just not doable or that they can't credibly say that. Um, but um, what it can be helpful are uh, dissenters within your community who think that your reasonable proposals, while ambitious and helpful, aren't good or strong enough. That helps. You might think, oh my God, there's division in the community. People will think that we don't have the, the wind at our backs. This will be terrible. What we've learned is that there are times that really helps. I will first, and my coalition will, always encourage those who think what we're asking for is not good enough. We'll say, you know what? We don't say, shh, don't dare say that. We have to all stick together. We say, you know what? Go for it. Tell the government, tell the media, um, and uh, make your point. And we like more people to be heard from, and we don't claim that we speak for everyone. The moment you claim you speak for everyone, it allows a single dissenter to blast that claim and to draw all the attention. The beauty, though, uh, in addition of having a dissenting group who say you should ask for more, is it lets you go to the government or the media or whoever and say, you know what, we're making requests that, we look, for re that look reasonable. We think that they're important and that we should get them. But let's be clear, there are people out there who think we deserve more. And they're out there pressuring, too. What that does is it makes it look like you're coming up the middle and puts pressure on the government at least to go as far as you want because thankfully there are people who are out there demanding more. Um, and I do this cynically, I do this quite openly. Um, and so rather than viewing people who disagree with you and want more as being people who are at cross purposes, they can actually really help your cause. How do you maintain momentum over a multi-year campaign? This is a huge challenge. We started our campaign for the Disability Act in 1994, and we did not ultimately win our Disability Act till uh, 2005. And it's very easy for people to give up. How do you maintain momentum? Again, just a few ideas. We have lots more. Um, it's important to divide the time into chunks with limited goals for an immediate two or three month period. If all we think about is, will we win our law, 
people will feel frustrated. When you get in a car to drive from Toronto to Florida, you got kids in the back seat, what's the first thing they ask as you pull out of the driveway? Are we then yet? Are we there yet? There are two possible answers to the kid who says, are we there yet? One is, no, we got 48 hours of straight driving, most of it's boring, the radio sucks, and uh, 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 bear with it, you know, deal with it. Or you could say, guess what? We're in Toronto, we're only an hour and a half from Niagara Falls, it's one of the wonders of the world. Guess what? We'll be there soon. And celebrate that milestone. And in a sense, I'm not equating our community to kids whining in the back of the car whatsoever, but I wanna say that it's important to give people a shorter range goal. It may just be a fight at a by-election, or it may be a campaign for a particular change that lets people focus on it, feel a sense of immediate goal, and then succeed if possible, and then celebrate your victories. Um, and then as those accumulate, one is in a position to say, Look at all of what we've done over the past two or three years. Look at the goals we've set and look what we've got. That in turn brings more people on board in your activity because people will see success. At the start, it'll be no matter what community you're organizing, it's going to be small because people won't know if you're going anywhere. Um, and um, it, it, it just it, it, it compounds the more uh, milestones along the way you hit. Now, let me turn to dealing with the political world. First, how do you deal with political parties? My view is one must be nonpartisan. One must be nonpartisan. One will have the least credibility if you're seen as in one party's camp, always for them or always against them. You've got to be clear that you're prepared to work with any political party that's prepared to pursue your agenda. My coalition uh, always says we're nonpartisan. We don't support or oppose any party. Uh, we're just working with a particular agenda. That means that we will be critical if a party is bad on our agenda, but we'll be complimentary if they're good on our agenda, whoever they are. And that may personally mean that the people within the coalition who may be strongly linked to one party, but have to thank another party. Nonpartisanship also helps people join, uh, inspire people to join your movement, because if people think you're just a liberal or you're just a conservative, or you're just NDP, and they're not, they're not going to want to get anywhere near you and that weakens your effectiveness. Um, one of the things that I use as a rule of thumb and my coalition uses as a rule of thumb when we're dealing with any political party is that our dealings with that party are confidential as between us and that party. What they end up committing to us is public and in writing. What we ask of all the parties is public and in writing. But any back and forth that goes on between political parties um, I won't tell the NDP what the Tories have told us, and I won't tell the Tories what the NDP have told us, and the same with the Liberals. It's important that they might want to find out from you what's going on in other camps, but it's important for each party to know that if they talk to you, it's not going to leak back to other parties. Anything that's going to come out will only be in the public arena. When you're dealing with each party, it's important to think of a couple of things. First, each has their own particular language. If I'm talking about accessibility to conservatives, I will talk about the fairness part of it, but I'll also talk about the, the business case for accessibility because, and, and our strategies to accommodate the needs of small business and so on. Now we'll talk about that with liberals and NDP too, but obviously conservatives, given their agenda, need to see it through the lens of their political agenda. Similarly, uh, I, I will uh, focus, shift, we will focus our, 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 our message or our emphasis uh, with each of the political parties um, in that way. Now they're also going to want to know about the focus that relates to each other. The NDP, if they're running, don't want to be seen as anti-business. They want to be, because otherwise they think they're going to be uh, cutting off themselves electorally. So they want to know how uh, your strategy uh, accommodates the needs of small business, frankly, even as much as the uh, conservatives or the liberals might. So while it's the same message in some ways, there are ways that you tune it that accommodate the platforms of each party and try to uh, respond to it. Um, that is not pandering, it's dealing with the reality that you've got to speak the language of the people um, you're trying to persuade. And they expect it, they don't expect anything different. When you're dealing with any political party, it's really important to find out who's actually making the platform decisions. That's not always readily apparent. In fact, one thing I will tell you I've learned in all my community advocacy is that whether it's government or opposition, the first time you approach them, the person they send you to deal with is their upfront person, not necessarily the real decision maker. And it takes a certain amount of time to try to figure out who the real decision maker is. 
Many of our strategies are counterintuitive. I'm going to give you one that is huge in that regard. Um, we are quite happy in my coalition if we get election commitments from a party that are not set out in their main platform document. Instead, they're set out in a separate letter to us. Now, the intuitive response to that kind of strategy is that's nuts. Because wouldn't you rather it be in the mainstream of their agenda, i.e. their formal platform, not in a side document that many people might not even see? Well, that may be intuitively sensible, but it's wrong. Why? A commitment on the Disabilities Act, to pass the Disabilities Act, if it was in a party's mainstream platform, might only be one or two sentences. It won't have any detail. When we got commitments from the Liberals and the New Democrats for the 1999 and 2003 elections, um, their commitments were in a letters to our coalition that are up on our old coalition's website, ontariansodacommittee.net, uh, um, and they're quite detailed way more detail than we could have ever gotten in a mainstream platform. So is it not in their mainstream platform and does that signal that may be less important? Some might see it that way, but after an election's over, when you're actually trying to get their, them to keep their commitments, nobody is going to get up uh, on, in a government and say, well, I know we made that commitment a letter to you during the election, but it wasn't in the main platform document, it was in a separate letter uh, instead that you've put all over the internet. They're just not going to do that. So sometimes the counterintuitive um, really helps. Let me talk to you now about appealing to politicians. And I, we put, people get oh, cynical and oh, they're just out for themselves and so on. There are some really um, thoughtful and important uh, strategies and ideas that we've learned over time. First, I want to talk to you about dealing with a politician who's not a cabinet minister. It's important to know some basic things about, uh, about politicians. The first is, contrary to the public cynicism about them, they are, uh, in my experience, without exception, hardworking, um, deeply dedicated to uh, public service, and um, very much interested uh, in advancing um, the public good. They may have a different view of the public good than you have, or your community has, or a lot of people have, and you might think that what they think is public interest is not the public interest at all, but they genuinely believe um, that, they're, um, that um, what they're doing is uh, in the public interest. I think a lot of the cynicism about them in that regard is, um, is unfair. They work um, incredibly long hours, um, days, nights, weekends, and wherever they go, they're sort of on call. So whenever you, and any politician of any political stripe, is, in my experience, torn between wanting to do what they think is the good, the right thing, and on the other hand, having to face the reality that they're but one member of a party, they've got electoral issues to deal with, they've got campaign, and they've also got interpersonal issues to deal with within their party. And they're really busy. So whenever you sit down with any politician, you better be ready for the fact that they've got something right before you, something right after you, probably calls while you're there, you got to be ready to accommodate someone who is that busy um, and, every, and that distracted. So what do you do? The first thing is try to figure out ways that they will naturally attach to your issue. If it's disability advocacy, there are three things that can come to play. The first is they may have a disability or a family member with a disability or a close friend with a disability or a staff member with a disability or a staff member who's got a family or a friend with a disability. In fact. Any politician who doesn't have one of those things, um, I don't think exists. Um, um, and so there's a natural attraction to our issue just by virtue of that. The second is they get calls from constituencies, constituent uh, members, voters in their constituency, um, who will be raising issues about their needs as people with disabilities. So even if they haven't been pickled in these issues before they went into public life, believe me, they've heard a lot about them. And third, they will have an interest, you can at least generate an interest in your issue either by their sense of justice or by tying it to their, their political agenda or because they're trying to move up in their party and this might be a, uh, a ball that they'd like to run with. Um, you should be able to work um, with them on one, uh, or by activating one, both, or all three of uh, those kind of considerations that are going on with them. Um, what can a backbencher do for you? Well, there's a number of things they can do. They, if, depending on opposition or even in government, they can lobby informally within their caucus to get support for you or even to approach the governing party if they're in opposition. 
They can ask questions in question period. They can help you negotiate the platform of their party or build, find natural other allies within their, within their caucus. They can bring in a private member's bill or a resolution for the legislature to vote on, depending how far they want to go with it. Um, and even further, as one illustration, we had one uh, member of the Liberals, when in opposition in Ontario, um, in the year 2000, actually hold shadow public consultations around Ontario, hearing from people with disabilities, which helped us build a community support. Now, let me turn and talk to you about meeting a cabinet minister. Um, this is an interesting and different, uh, everything I've just told you comes into play, but there's a bunch of other things that come into play uh, as well. First, it, it's our, my experience and our experience that if you're going to want to work with and meet with somebody that high up, you don't start there. It's usually best to start at the lowest level of the uh, organizational hierarchy, uh, meet with them, raise your issues, though that person may have absolutely no authority to do anything other than listen and give you a little background, but you got to start there. And then you work your way up to their director, and then you work your way up to their assistant deputy minister, and then at times you may work your way up to the deputy minister, and only after all of that going to the minister. Now, we don't always do this, but often we do this. Why do you go through that? Number one, on your way up, you will learn tons. Not just about the formal government structure, but about who's really calling the shots. Because at some point on the way up, you will find a natural ally. Somebody who cares about your issues or has been involved in it either because they have a personal investment or because of just it makes policy sense. And they may just along the way share some good ideas with you. They're not being um, irresponsible or disloyal to the government in doing that. They're being good public servants by helping educate uh, a community member on how to how to work their way through a complex government regime. There's a second reason for going up the food chain or hierarchy um, uh, this way. If you go too high too fast, you're giving that person an out by sending you back to the bottom. If you go to a deputy minister first and you make your pitch, that deputy minister might say, listen, this is all very interesting. I've never really heard about this before. Have you talked this, about this with the policy people or the operational people in my ministry? You have to say no, and they'll smile and say, well, thanks for coming in. I think that's your next step. On the other hand, if you've worked your way up the, up the ladder, then when you sit down with an assistant deputy or a deputy minister, you're in a position to say, look, I'm coming to you after I've taken the following steps. It also, uh, and so at that point, when you get to that higher level individual, they can't just slough you off on someone below, and I don't mean they would do that cynically, I mean they just may reassign it to where it should be considered first. Rather, you're in a position to say, okay, Ms. Uh, Deputy Minister or Mr. Assistant Deputy Minister, I've gone up these steps, here's what we've learned so far, and here are the core issues. And then, of course, by the time you get to a minister, you can narrow the issues that need ministerial attention. If you get time with a minister, that is really scarce time. You want to use it to advantage. You don't want to use it resolving things that could have been resolved way further down the ladder. So you've gone all your way up the, up the ladder. You get a meeting with a minister. What do you do? Few things. Number one, you got to set your goals. What do I want the minister to do? You don't, can't just go in and say, here's a problem. You want to be able to go in and say, here's a problem. Here's what we've done about it. Here's why it matters. And here's what we're asking you to do. And by the way, you may only get a half an hour with them, so like a lawyer in a court case with time limits, use your time wisely. And frankly, don't mess around a whole lot, of, waste a whole lot of time with howdy doody, nice to meet you, isn't it uh, raining outside, it is, isn't the weather terrible. You know, get on with the time, don't let it get frittered away or you'll suddenly find out it's gone, they've got their next meeting. Um, in order to uh, have the meeting be effective, it's our experience, that it is very wise to first get in touch with one of the minister's political staff. In their office, there will be political staff. And I will brief the political staffer on everything we're gonna raise at the meeting. I will also brief people further down the hierarchy about what's gonna be raised at the meeting. And I'll do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, I want the minister in a position to not be surprised. Um, this isn't like a surprise cross-examination where you think you got a brilliant knockout punch and you don't want a witness to be prepared. You want them to have had a chance to think through this because you're trying to direct them towards um, a solution. But also, if you say, Minister, as a result of this meeting, I'd like to ask if you'll do X, you don't want the minister to say, well, that's an interesting idea, but I really have never turned my mind to that before. 
You'd rather be in a position of looking at the minister and say, we're asking you to do X, as I've briefed your deputy and your, your policy advisor that I'd be raising. So that all of a sudden you've cut the legs out from underneath any capacity to say, um, um, oh shucks, I never heard about this before, can you give me some time to work on it? Um, as, as a way to, to, uh, of a minister to not confront and deal with what you're, what you're raising. Um, There are times we, um, um, excuse me, the, the, it's usually worthwhile to not only brief the staffer, but at the meeting, offer a, an action list for follow-up. Here are the specific things we're asking you to do. And you may follow up with a letter to confirm that. But it's also worthwhile to ask about specific next steps. When can we meet again? Who in your office should I follow up with? Because I can tell you the minister's going to leave your meeting, rush off to another meeting, and you want to actually help them formulate their uh, follow-up action memo within their office by essentially giving it to them. You can't say, now, minister, here's the memo to send your staff, but you can give them the content, which essentially does their work for them in that regard. Now, let me, uh, let me shift to a whole other arena. Beyond formal meetings with members of uh, the legislature, cabinet ministers, and staff, there are times the government will hold a public consultation. It's important to harness those to your best advantage. Um, often a lot of the heavy negotiating or persuasion doesn't take place at those events. Um, it may take place in informal meetings and conversations. But nevertheless, public consultations on any issue, whether it's public hearings on a bill or a policy consultation, whatever it may be, they provide a phenomenal opportunity to accomplish a lot. In order to do that, the first thing you gotta do is say, what do I wanna get out of this consultation? Well, there's the obvious, I wanna convince the government to do a particular policy, uh, implement a particular policy. But there are other benefits to a public consultation as well. Let me suggest some. One is, they provide a fantastic opportunity to energize and mobilize your own community. Um, your own community may not be involved in going uh, week after week to meetings with, with cabinet ministers. It's hard to get those meetings. But if a public consultation is provided, this sets a table, it opens a door, it provides a platform where you can turn to your community and say, hey folks, here's an opportunity to have your say. We'd love you to all get involved. Um, and that kind of mobilizing um, has benefits beyond just persuading the government. Obviously, the more people that come forward and, and pitch on your issue, uh, the more persuasive, uh, uh, the more chance you've got of convincing the government to do whatever it is you want to do. But on the other hand, that's not all. The more people come forward, the more people you're mobilizing. The more people who initially thought, there's no way I can have any impact on the government, it's intransigent, it's a big bureaucracy, they never listen to us, um, and so why bother? The more of those folks, and by the way, I completely understand why people think that way, I don't look uh, negatively on them, um, but as a community organizer, I know I gotta work to counteract, and we've gotta work to counteract that attitude. But in any event, um, but the more people actually come to a public forum and get a chance, or a public consultation, and state their piece, that's the more, peop the more people who've overcome some of that, uh, that impediment to action. People who will be ready to take the next step, to go home and pick up the phone and call a call in radio station and repeat what they just said at the public consultation, who will write a letter to the editor, who will talk to their friends, go to their kids' school, raise these issues, and, and spread the word. A public consultation also provides a phenomenal avenue for getting media attention. I'm going to talk more about the media in a couple of minutes, but it's a, 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 I want to emphasize just because you think it's a public issue that's important doesn't mean the media does. And if you just go to the media and say, uh, there is inaccessible public transit in Ontario facing people with disabilities, they're not going to cover that. If you say, there's a public forum tomorrow night on barriers people with disabilities face in transportation, come and hear their specific pro individual stories. That, that's an event. Media doesn't cover issues, the media covers events. And a consultation can be catapulted into an event. How do you best facilitate your community taking part in consultations? Again, remember, the aim is harmony, not unanimity. So the goal is not making sure the only people who come forward sing from our song sheet or something like that. 
Um, it's important to first educate your community through action kits or tips about what the consultation is, how to take part, give them the email address so they can send in a request, and so on. In the disability arena, it's really important to emphasize the government early on that the consultation should be open, not invitation only. It should be fully accessible with sign language, an accessible building, captioning, uh, and so on. Often government doesn't know to do all that, so you've got to work with government to make sure they do. Um, one thing I've learned about the, uh, the deaf community, if they don't see an announcement that sign language is available, they may well, some may assume it's not available. So make sure it's in the ad and then more of them will turn out. Understandably, understandably. Why bother going unless you know for sure you're gonna have sign language? Um, um, the next important thing that we've found that is helpful is we try to get a brief or a position paper out to our community before the consultation begins. At least a draft. Not because we want everybody to sing from our, our, uh, our hymn book, but to get people thinking of ideas. And if people come forward and they use our ideas, that's great. If they don't attribute it to us, we don't care. We don't claim copyright. The more people that use it, the better. But also, it can help get people thinking about their own ideas, which may be different from ours, may even contradict ours, but it's easier for them to do that by reading our proposals. So getting it out there to give people a resource to make use of is, uh, is very helpful. Uh, let me then leap from that to talk to you for just two, two or three minutes about writing a brief like that. Um, you'll see lots of these up on our website. In another lecture I talk more about this, but it's our strategy to put out a draft brief first to get people's ideas, even though that means showing the government a draft of our position even before we finalize it and even before we know we're going to say any of it. Um, the advantage of that is it gets input from our community and helps educate our community and if the timelines for consultations are tight, uh, we may not be able to get our final brief out in time. We send out a draft, we get comments and input, we finalize it. But one of the core theme strategies we use in our brief is that we try to make it persuade anyone who reads it that what we're proposing is a good idea. So it shouldn't just talk to the government as a regulator. It should talk to business. It should talk to the disability community. It should talk to the media. It should be persuasive to anyone. We find that we are at the same time educating and informing our community, and indeed convincing members of our community, at the same time as we're trying to convince and persuade the government. And if our arguments are full of holes that the, uh, somebody in the business or the broader public sector might say that's wrong, we don't want that kind of argument out there because if they shoot it down, it undermine, we'd rather have arguments that are strong and that are um, uh, unassailable. Um, in our briefs, and if you look at any of them, and some of the, I have community members say, Lepofsky, how can you write a 100-page document and call it a brief? But what we will do is begin with a summary, and if all you read is the summary, that's all you need. Gives you enough. But then we will provide an explanation of who we are and what our agenda is or what our priorities are. And then we'll go through and make specific recommendations. And if it's for legislation, we may offer specific wording that we want and we'll explain why. And you're able to read, if you look at one of our briefs, what you'll see is if it's commenting on a bill, it'll say section so-and-so provides X, here's what's wrong with it, here's what we recommend. And we will then aggregate all our recommendations in an appendix. So again, if you don't have time to read the whole thing, you can look at the appendix um, and read all our recommendations in one place. So whether you read our summary or just the appendix, there's a lot there for those who don't want to read the whole 100-page document. But for the people who are going to do the, the detailed policy work, they've got the detailed policy work there. Let, um, let me now talk very briefly about the formal process of going to a standing committee of the legislature. One particular process that is uh, doesn't come up very often and is worth leaping on whenever the opportunity arises is when there's a committee before the of the legislature holding hearings on a bill. A bill gets voted on for first reading and then second reading and then it may be sent to a standing committee for hearings and then clause by clause debate. Um, our coalition, um, both my current one and its predecessor, was active on several bills uh, that concern us and in each case what we will do is we will put out a little four or five page primer to our membership 
on how a bill goes through the legislature. Most lay people don't know about first reading versus second reading, private member versus public bill, um, uh, clause by clause debate, what kind of amendments are permissible, what's not. So we actually spoke to the House of the Clerk of the Legislature, or the Office of the Clerk of the Legislature years ago, got our own kind of primer from them, summarized it, and made it available to educate our community. I ended up having the clerk's office actually ask me if they could circulate it in other contexts. We said, sure. If it's that helpful, you gave us the ideas. We just wrote it down. Um, but hearings before the legislature are an important platform. Now, I will tell you formally, um, they are not the place where the action occurs. In other words, hearings and clause-by-clause -clause debate are the staged activity, but it's in the back room that the decisions are made. But that doesn't mean that either of them are unimportant. During hearings, it's important to get as many groups lined up to participate, to encourage them to sign up, uh, and to get them to come before the standing committee so the committee hears from as many people as possible. Standing committees like to hear from organizations, but they love to hear from individuals. Because to politicians, hearing from John or Jane Q. Public may be uh, more interesting or more compelling to them than some organization that's got a brief that's all lawyered up and thought through and polished and, and media uh, uh, scanned and all that sort of thing. So both can make a huge difference. And some of the most, um, uh, one of the most amazing presenters, and we've had many, is a woman named Penny LeClaire in Ottawa. Penny is deaf and blind. And she went before, I've, I've heard back from politician after politician, all political parties. And it's just not, it's not patronizing, oh, isn't it wonderful a deafblind person can do this and that kind of patronizing stuff. They found her to be powerful as a speaker. And her describing the barriers facing people who are deaf and blind, articulated in a standing committee by someone who is both deaf and blind, was, um, was extraordinary. Many other examples over our years of people who've done that. Indeed, I have been most delighted when I watch or read transcripts of hearings on bills we've done when people that we've never met or heard of come forward, possibly borrowing our ideas, often coming up with their own, but meeting our goal of harmony not uh, uh, in making our message. Uh, one of the odd things you may think about in, uh, in, the, political pro in the hearing process is they will, they'll give you 10 or 15 minutes or whatever, and they'll often tell you, use what time you want, and then the rest is used left for questions. Should you leave time for questions? There are, in community advocacy, a million strategy calls. Here's an example uh, of one. In a courtroom, I love when a judge asks questions, because it's an insight into their, their, their reasoning process, their thinking, whatever's worrying them. Standing committee, not so much. I'm not afraid of questions, but what I find is politicians tend to make long speeches in their question and eat up all the time, and then they'll ask a question like, so do you think people with disabilities need more? After they make this long speech, and all of a sudden, if you had 15 minutes and if you left seven for, for questions, you've had a long, and by the way, this is not uh, limited to any political party, and it could be politicians who agree with you or disagree with you. Either which way I find often, not exclusively, but often I find the questions eat up time that I'd rather tie up, I'd, I'd rather use more effectively in our actual presentation. Um, let me talk to you briefly about clause by clause debate. Oh, excuse me, public hearings like a consult, one more thing about public hearings. Public hearings like a public consultation can be used as a platform to get media coverage. Media often don't cover them, but there's some ways um, to uh, uh, improve the capacity for there to be coverage. There is one committee room at Queen's Park that is wired to be broadcast on the, on the parliamentary channel, the provincial uh, legislature channel. If the legislature is not sitting, that hearing goes live and then will get replayed. So I, uh, one thing we've done in the past is to try to actually lobby to get our hearings in that room on days when the legis or hours when the legislature is not sitting. It also provides an opportunity to get a, a DVD recording um, uh, of, made of the of the, uh, of the event, and then put it up now on YouTube. Um, a phenomenal opportunity. Now, clause by clause debate over a bill is a hugely complex subject. I'm only gonna give you a couple of headliners. It's where the uh, amendments from either party can be tabled. It's important to understand first that you don't just walk in and say, by the way, here goes, can you propose amendments now? They are thought out before clause by clause starts, after the hearings, and on an important bill, each government will announce what amendments they're gonna table, often the day before clause by clause begins. 
To get to that point, so the really decisive point is when the parties table what their amendments will be. To that end, what you need to do is to get to the three parties while the hearings are still going on, giving them a list of your priorities. They may come out of your bill. And then what each party may do is decide what they want to propose, and they give it to an office at the legislature called Legislative Council. They are lawyers who work for the legislature, not for any particular political party. They will draft amendments for whichever politician asks. You've got to make sure you get your package of ideas to each party early enough that they can get it to Legislative Council in time for it to be drafted and tabled with the committee. When the committee's actually voting, um, and I don't mean any disrespect for the uh, members who sit, but there's often someone who is determining on behalf of the government or the opposition party which they're going to go for. Um, and you will see a process in the committee room of staffers passing notes back and forth, either on the government side or on the opposition side. It's important to develop a relationship with those staffers um, and I uh, often have a good relationship. I teased one that I was going to intercept their notes and switch in mine. Um, they didn't think it was funny. Um, but, um, and often there's a chance to, not often, but there can be a chance to negotiate wording of amendments right there in the lobby, either with some of the members of the committee or with some of the staffers. But it's important to, not, to understand that the formal, what's going on at the committee is often driven by a lot of this informal uh, process going behind it. The final thing I want to tell you about amendments, and then I, and then I want to, I want to uh, conclude by a few, just a couple of minutes talking about dealing with the media. Um, uh, with every strategy move, it's important to look at its benefits in the short run and the long run. Like you, you might think that, well, every time the government votes down an amendment, that's just a big loss. And so we lost, just like if you're in court, you argue a case, you lose, it's a loss. Not so fast. Amendments can have long-term consequences. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. Um, in 2001, the then conservative government under Mike Harris proposed the Disabilities Act, but a weak one. We asked for certain amendments. The opposite, we got the liberals and the NDP in opposition to propose a bunch of them. Again, got them to them early enough. They went through legislative council, got drafted, and so on. The government had a majority, voted them all down. So on, an, on a, a short range view, you'd say, oh, this is an example of, of you know, just straight out loss, why waste the time? But they were really important for us. They were important because by getting the NDP and the Liberals to propose them, our view was we put the NDP and the Liberals on the record supporting the amendments they were proposing. So when we went into the 2003 election, these amendments were proposed in 01 and, and voted down, we went to the Liberals and the NDP and each asked for commitments that they would pass a dis stronger Disabilities Act that would, among other things, embody the substance of the amendments that they had proposed two years earlier. Well, what's the party going to do? Say, no, no, we, if elected, will not do that, which we criticized the Tory government for refusing to do, and we asked them to do. And in fact, for example, if you look at the letter Dalton McGinty wrote to our coalition during the, on April 7, uh, 2003, um, uh, promising a Disabilities Act if elected, he said, among other things, that would embody the substance, incorporate the substance of the amendments that they proposed two years earlier. So that's one way they can help. There's another way they can help. In 05, the McGinty Liberals passed the, uh, a stronger Disability Act. We proposed amendments. The government made some of them, but the opposition proposed others that the government wouldn't accept. Now, again, you might say, well, you're working with a government that you've got a good relationship with now. They were really open to us, but you didn't get everything you wanted. Isn't that a loss? And the answer is not so fast. Some of the things we proposed in 05 and we didn't get, we always ke we can keep in our, in our hip pocket for future events. So when some, after a couple of years of experience under the Disabilities Act from 05 to 07, we found out that certain things weren't working as well as we and the government thought. So we could come back to the government and take some of the ideas from the amendments we proposed and lost and pitch them to the government for election commitments as policies. And some of them we succeeded on. 2009, the government was required under the Disabilities Act to appoint an independent review of the Disabilities Act. And there were certain things, and we thought things weren't working as well as they could, and we told the independent reviewer, Charles Beer, here's how you should fix it. 
gave a list of ideas, some of which were things we proposed in 05 and the government turned down. We could turn to Charles Beer, an independent reviewer, and say, you know what, four years later, turns out we had good ideas that should have been considered. And you know what, some of our ideas he recommended. So things that we initially proposed as amendments in 05 were turned down at the time. Some were adopted as a matter of government policy in 07. Some, an independent review proposed in 09. And some of them, uh, uh, of the 09 recommendations, are now being um, implemented years later. So we're in it for the long haul, but there are long haul consequences that can be good, even from things you thought uh, were bad news. Concluding with some media could be the subject of not only a lecture, but a whole course. Let me just give you a couple of key points. The media are, of course, a really important avenue for any kind of community advocacy and organizing to convince the public and also to signal the government and the opposition that you're a force worth paying attention to. When you try to go to the media to bring a story, um, a few thoughts in mind, number one, it's an advocacy exercise with the media just as much as it's an advocacy exercise bringing an issue to the government. Um, journalists are similarly overworked, overburdened, understaffed, and under a lot of pressure. You've got to get to the point with them even more quickly than with anyone else, or at least as quickly as with anybody else in the, uh, in the government or opposition parties. When you write a news release, you are in effect writing a news story. It should be written such that they couldn't write it any better. It should make the point, it should include quotes, and so on, and if a reporter really likes it, and they're too busy, they should be able to literally cut and paste liberally from it. Um, and just as it's the ultimate compliment when a judge cuts and pastes from your, a factum that a lawyer files in court, or a brief in court, it's similarly a compliment if a journalist decides that part of your news release made the point. You should be ready for the fact that um, News, uh, you will bring the media uh, lots of stories of which only a small number will get picked up. It's important never to get despondent from that. It's like fishing. You throw the line, I don't mean you're fishing for stories, but you throw that line in a million times and then you get a bite. Celebrate the bites you get and build on them. When the media first hears about you and your community, they won't know anything about you. And you have to build your credibility. You've got to build, just as you have to build relationships with political parties, you've got to build relationships with journalists. And over time, they will come to get to know you. There are times you will call a reporter to say, I'm not calling with a story today. I just had some background I thought might help you. So that they know fearful, you don't want them fearful that every time they see your phone number on their call display, oh no, it's another story, I'm busy. Um, it's important to build that kind of um, relationship. Um, I believe that one should be as, uh, hold oneself to, as high a standard when giving information to a news organization or at a news conference as you would uh, apply to yourself when making arguments in a courtroom. Whether you're a lawyer or not, I think it's important for your credibility and that of your coalition not to overstate things, not to say things you can't back up, even if you think they would have a lot of zing to them, um, and not to um, even accede to a question from a journalist that you'd love to agree to but you really don't know. Um, I have found, in the end, that my experience working with the media has helped me as a lawyer in my day job. Um, we lawyers um, are wordy sorts, as I've mentioned in a couple of other lectures, and uh, there's a huge pressure to get to the point uh, with, the, with uh, radio or print or television journalism. And uh, it's one of the le lessons I've learned that uh, has really helped is that the the um, pithiness and the to-the-point clarity that the journalist demands of us is something that I believe should be taught in law school as a standard uh, writing skill. Let me... Let me um, conclude by saying creativity, creativity, creativity. In any of this community advocacy, it's not just a matter of what did somebody else do, it worked, you try it. Look for new ways of doing things. If you're giving stories to the media and they're not taking them up, look for other ways to reach the public through the media. Write a guest column for the newspaper, they might let you write a story uh, even if they wouldn't cover the story themselves. That's happened a number of times. Find avenues where the media has an open vehicle to reach the public. Call-in radio is for, superb for this. 
Don't sweat a news conference where you didn't get any, any reporters or any coverage. Now we have technology we didn't have 10 years ago. Bring a, a, a webcam or a video cam, record it, post it on YouTube. The news conference remains vibrant even if there's no journalist there. If we preserve it on YouTube and then start using Facebook, Twitter, and email uh, to spread the word. Just Google, go to our AODA Alliance YouTube channel and you'll see what I mean. Um, don't sweat losses. Not only in the legislature, in the media. Some of the most important days in our campaign for accessibility got no media attention. Some of the worst days in terms of things not going well later became the platform for things that turned out um, really well. And remember that no matter how many times you think you know how to do it, there is a member in your community who's going to think of something better, whether it's Michael Lewis and his uh, guitar uh, or someone else in that situation who will come up with something that will resonate. Always be open to uh, other people coming up with new ideas. I welcome the opportunity to, to speak to you about this and I'm I'm eager to find ways for us to teach this in law school so that it becomes part of the repertoire of advocacy for lawyers, not just in the courtroom, but in the community. Thank you very much.